second talk, and the topic for today's talk is frequency function. Some of you probably have looked at the notes already. It's a bit technical thing that we're going to, to do, but I'll try to do very simple thing on the blackboard and try to convince you how beautiful and nice it is. I learned it myself when I was a PhD student, basically from a very nice article of Garofalo and Van Hollen, and I would never dream of lecturing about it here, but it, it's, a, it's a very nice and fascinating thing. I hope you will enjoy it, even you, if you're missing the, the match right now. So we'll start with harmonic functions. Usual harmonic function in RD. And we want to have some feeling about how this function grows. So we fix points, say the origin, or you can move it whatever you want, and look at the average of your function over the sphere of radius r. I will forget about the volume of the sphere in the normalization constant and write it in this way. So h of r is just up to a constant average of the harmonic function on the sphere of radius r. We are in rd, so this is the normalization factor. If your function is a constant, you'll get a constant. If your function is a polynomial, if h is a polynomial of degree n, homogeneous one, then when you average the function there, you'll get constant times r to the power to n. So for this case, h of r is constant r to 2n. What happens for more complicated harmonic functions if you try to feel what harmonic function is? Look at the balls, at least we know the maximum principle. We believe that the maximum grows when you let the radius grow. You would expect that the same would happen with the average. This harmonic function should grow somehow. Let us make simple computation and take the derivative of this one in R. And you differentiate this, think about taking the average over sphere of this one. You can convince yourself rather easily that what you get is the normal derivative of this function. And if you think about it as a normal derivative of h squared times 1 and apply the Green's formula, you get immediately that this is integral from the ball, the Laplacian of this function, that is 2 times gradient h squared, since we have a harmonic function h. You can do it in different way and take the derivative of this part, this derivative of this part and see what happens, but you will get the same answer here. So the derivative is positive. It's a nice increasing function, but there is much more to the story. If you look at the ratio, I take the logarithmic derivative of h multiplied by r. And I will use the following notation. i of r will be one half of this integral. So there is two here, and this is r to one minus d 
integral br plus h squared. So not only our function h is increasing and the derivative is positive, you can check that the derivative of this ratio is positive. There are two ways to do it. One way is outlined in the lecture notes for more general situation when we, you have elliptic equation actually, and we will go back to it. Another one is in the exercise you can use for harmonic function expansion in polynomials in spherical harmonics and check that the function that the average over sphere satisfies this inequality. It tells you that actually function is in a way log convex. Once again, go back to it. So starting from a harmonic function, looking at the averages over spheres, we by a straightforward computation, that is also there is some miracle happens there. It's nice to understand. Get function with this property. Let me use this property in some way. So I will write n of r. That is this ratio, and the claim here says that function n is increasing when r is increasing. Say that n is the frequency of frequency function. Now well, it's in frequency once again if we think about homogeneous polynomial, then h is r to 2n up to a constant. If you look at this ratio, you get exactly 2n with our notation when we divide it by, by 2 if h is homogeneous harmonic polynomial, then n of r is just a constant that is the degree of this polynomial. Yeah, so I should write it this way. Right. For polynomials, it's a constant function. But otherwise, it's a non-decreasing one. First corollary that we have from this observation that the frequency function is monotone is the following. Let me consider three concentric circles with three different radiuses. Denote them R naught, R1, and R2. And I want to compare the average values of my function, harmonic one over these three spheres. When I take average all time, I think all the time I, I'm thinking about this one square of the function. So take first two R zero and R one. And to go from R0 to R1, I have to integrate the logarithmic de derivative. So the integral from R0 to R1 of this one. I'll multiply by R, divide by R, and use the fact that this function is my frequency up to factor two. So what I get is two times the value of frequency at some point between those two times the integral of dr over r. This is log 
R1 minus local, R0. I can do exactly the same thing between R1 and R2. Let me. Yes, so this, uh, this one here, R1, is just some number between R0 and capital R1, where the mean value is zero. Yes, I'm integrating this one against this measure. It's a value at some point time that one. And now I'll have to, to move back to the first blackboard and you will try to look at both. So I'll do the same between R1 and R2 and get that this is the value of the frequency function at some point R2. R2 is between capital R1 and capital R2 times log R2 minus log R1. And finally, I want to use the fact that this frequency function is increasing, so this value is strictly larger than the one over there, than this one. So what we will see from this is that this ratio is larger than the one that we get from the first two spheres. If you write down exponents of both sides, you will easily see that this inequality means exactly the following one. I can bound h on the middle sphere by h on the smaller one times h of the larger one with the right exponents. And the exponents are exactly the ones that you need to go from R0 and R2 to R1. So you have a very beautiful, precise inequality for all harmonic functions. If you remember complex analysis course, probably realize immediately that it looks very much like Hadamard three circle theorem. It tells you that if you have an analytic function, the complex plane or part of the complex plane, and you look at the maximum value of this function, say on the circle of radius r, then you have exactly this inequality. Also, if you think about this one and try to remember what was the way to prove it, the way we are used to think about this inequality, it's the consequence of the fact that the log on the analytic function is subharmonic. This is what allows you to get 
multiplicative estimates for the maximum value of, of, of function. If you work between analytic functions and harmonic functions in higher dimensions, you know how frust frustrating is the fact that in complex analysis you can always use this trick. Have analytic function or gradient of harmonic function, you know that the log of the gradient is subharmonic and it gives you many, many estimates. Here we have estimates that look exactly like that, except for L2 norms, but not maximum norms. And this one holds in any dimension without any subharmonicity of the log that we use in complex analysis. So I think it's already the first miracle that you see that you have this very nice and precise inequality for harmonic functions in higher dimensions. Turns out that much more is going on there. For harmonic functions, you can still say that, okay, they are real and analytic in a sense. And they should have some properties that are close to analytic functions. But we will see that this is not about real analyticity, it's about ellipticity. A very similar result holds for all elliptic equations. Before I do that, I will do one more thing. I will rewrite three sphere inequality. It's what this is. For harmonic functions, it's, as I said, very precise and nice. And it tells you that the L2 norm of harmonic function of a sphere is, if I choose, for example, 2R, R, and 4R here. you will see that my normalization cancels and I have this nice inequality. We also know that different norms are equivalent. We have local boundaries result for not only harmonic functions, but solutions of elliptic equations, which tells you that the maximum of a function over a ball is bounded by a two norm say of the sphere of radius 2 or there. And this kind of inequality allows you to go from L2 inequalities to L infinity inequalities that look similar to under Mars 3 spheres theory. Sorry? No, because if you average it, all these places, they will cancel. No. By, yeah, it's here, here I need the average, yeah, thank you. Here I need the average, definitely. Let us write it in this way or, yeah. okay. Constant R to one minus D over this, this one. Yes, and the power. Mm, where should we put it? I could have written square. Yeah, sorry for that. So by comparing these norms, you see that for any three concentric circles like that, you have the inequality for the maximums. I'll call those just B0, B1, and B2. With some better between 0 and 1, it depends on the ratios of the 
radiuses of the balls. It's not so beautiful as in other Mars 3 circle here, but there is some beta between 0 and 1 and the constant c, so that for any harmonic function we have this inequality. I'll also ask, uh, I will also would like to have a general version of, of this statement, and instead of three circles, I'll have three domains. So I will have my harmonic function H in some domain omega, have a small ball inside, and some compact set that you can think about it a set in between. It's not important that it contains the ball. What is important is it's a compact in, in omega. Then if you use three balls theorem many times and go from this ball to a little bit larger one, then probably take a part of it, go to a larger one, you can reach from this ball inside by looking at the chains of ball, any point of your compact set. And you will need a finite number of steps to do it. This number of steps doesn't depend on function. You will iterate this estimate, and you can see that there is this version of the three domains theorem, so the maximum on a compact set of our function h is bounded by constant maximum on the ball to some new power, say gamma. Once again, it's power between 0 and 1 times the maximum over the whole omega h, 1 minus gamma. And this, the constants are terrible but they don't depend on the function. And all of that is a consequence of the fact that the frequency function is monotone. Now we'll go from harmonic functions to solutions of elliptic equations and see that a lot of this is still true there. So once again, we look at solutions of second order uniformly elliptic equations in divergence form. Yeah, thank you. And we will definitely need that this is uniformly Lipschitz. We'll do the following trick. We will look at one point and renormalize our coefficients such that at this point, say the origin A is identity matrix can change the coordinates, and then when you define your balls, the balls will correspond to these new variables. And define function mu of x, that is, some weight. Remember, this is uniformly elliptic, so the weight is controlled by two constants. If an H of R in a similar way, 
now it will be R2, one minus D, integral of mu x. x squared. The surface measure for harmonic functions, the weight is one and we get back the average that we were working with before. And if you differentiate this one and look at the main term, you will see that the main term is integral over the gradient squared, but now is matrix A over the whole ball. And as before, define this function Sorry. Depending on the function and the equation of u and a, we define this quantity. Yes, I'm sorry for that. On top and h on the bottom. I assume that you do Nicola Garofalo and von Hollin says you that this function is already as good as it was before. If you mo just do a small correction and multiply it to some thing like that, this is non decreasing. on some interval from zero to zero. So I have two constants, C and R, zero here. They depend on the constants for the apparatus. And the dimension of the space. By the constants, I mean the ellipticity constant and the Lipschitz constant here. So you still have this phenomenon, ph sorry, this phenomenon, no. <laughs> the same thing happens for elliptic equations, and yeah, you see that if you just compute the derivative, it's not positive anymore, but you can control it in a nice way, and it tells you that after multiplication by exponential function, you get an increasing function. I will not do computation there done in the lecture notes, but this is enough to show three balls theorem. Three balls theorem, and from there you go to maximum version using local boundness estimates, and to the version with three domains as well. It was a very nice approach that immediately gives you strong unique continuation result from the monotonicity of the frequency function. You can tell more than that, you can see that your function is a nice Magenhaupt weight. I'm not going to go there as well right now. But what I want to announce at this point that our aim at the f last lecture would to prove this kind of inequality where you replace the small set by measurable sink. Go from a ball to a measurable set there. This would, will be our aim at the end. But for the moment, let us enjoy this nice frequency function and see what it tells us. So I will take away this one. Y 
one more remark about the frequency if you look at this function and first let us think about this ratio. Let's take R that is very, very small and see what happens when we go to small R near the point. We already know that this function is almo almost monotonic in R. When you go to very small R's, your function, suppose everything is smooth, your function looks like it's first term of the Taylor expansion at this point. So you'll get something that looks like r to the power to k, where k is the vanishing order of your function there. And you, when you compute the frequency, let us divide by 2 as before, you'll get exactly k that is a vanishing order of the function at this point. So by controlling the frequency of the function, we also control the vanishing quarter of the function. And if you believe in the fact that this frequency is monotone up to this thing, you can, from global information in your function, from knowing how it grows on large scales, you can have some control on the small scale. You can go back to, to zero and see that if I know that the frequency is bounded, by something on the large scale, the vanishing quarter is bounded on the small scale. There is one thing that I want to prove now and connect the frequency to eigenfunctions, but before that I will change my notation in a way. There is another way to fill the local growth of the function. This was the frequency I will call the or the quantity doubling index and try to convince you that they're almost the same thing. So given function u and the ball b I'll look at the doubling index of u at the ball b. To do it, I take the maximum of the double ball, divided by the maximum of the ball. And I want this 